Joining me now is Christopher Rhodes, lecturer in government at Harvard University and lecturer in social sciences at Boston University, and Suzanne Nossel, the CEO of Pan America, an advocacy group at the intersection of literature and human rights. She's also the author of Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. Good morning to both of you. Thank you for joining us, Suzanne. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Christopher, thank you for being with us. Suzanne, let me just start with you, because you and I have been talking about this for a while, and I've been wanting to get at this for a while. We have both acknowledged the, the right and the necessity of parents being involved in what their kids are learning and, and, and expressing concerns about that, and that's what school boards are for, and that's what, uh, you know, school associations are for. But that's just not what this is. I think that's right, Allie. Look, I think there are parents who have genuine concerns, who kind of come at this honestly, who maybe find that some of the materials in their kid's classroom are not what they're accustomed to, that they don't comport to the values that are being conveyed in a Utah family, for example. But it is the orchestrated nature of this and the link to longstanding educational movements, movements that sought decades ago to get prayer uh, into schools, movements that when they couldn't get prayer adopted, uh, pushed toward homeschooling and pushed toward much more liberal rules in terms of people being able to take their kids out of public school and educate them at home. And then even movements really that are about trying to dismantle our public schools, get us to convert to a voucher system so that people can pick and choose. They want to send their kids to a religious school. They can do so on public money, no matter what that does to the public schools that serve the community at large. Betsy DeVos, is part of this movement. She's called for the abolition of the Department of Education, a department right. that she once ran. Yeah, and, and you make an interesting point because, as I mentioned, uh, people have started calling, people who don't like these things don't call them public schools anymore. They call them government uh, schools. Dr. Rhodes, you wrote in an op-ed uh, recently uh, in February. You said, it's become clear that the censorship of books and classroom material was not the end game, but merely an opening salvo to greater demands for control of information and discourse. The right-wing anti-democratic movement is now moving beyond mere censorship and entering a phase of surveillance and the very thought policing that concerns Conservatives like to accuse liberals of employing. And I tried to bring some of that up in the intro where we talked about um, a, a, a place where they're reporting these things to the sheriff or that in Florida, uh, any instance of a request to ban a book has to be referred to the state. This is going a lot further than what my kid is reading in class. No, absolutely. Um, and it's been quite disturbing some of the things that we've seen, some of these groups, uh, that one organization, for example, uh, County Citizens Defending Freedom uh, recently held a workshop in Corpus Christi on how to observe teachers' social media accounts to find information that could be used against them in these kind of accusations, labeling teachers as groomers, as providing quote-unquote pornography and whatnot. There were a couple of bills uh, that were proposed last year in Florida and a couple of other states that would actually have implanted cameras in classrooms so that parents could watch at home and could stream to monitor in real time what teachers were teaching and how they were instructing their students. Those particular bills haven't passed yet, but this is the kind of level of surveillance uh, that we've seen that these groups are proposing and criminalizing, in some cases, filing lawsuits against teachers, against even private booksellers. In Virginia, there was a lawsuit against Barnes and Nobles trying to restrict the type of books that it could sell to minors and whatnot. And even criminal complaints in places like uh, Howard County, Maryland, again, using this charge of providing pornography, quote unquote, to minors in order to try to ban these books and to even penalize teachers and educators who would provide such reading materials to their students. Suzanne, what's the, what's the line here between uh, material that people say is inappropriate for their kids to uh, learn about versus control and, and political power? Because you described uh, earlier about prayer and homeschooling and, and, and vouchers. But in fact, this, you could compare this to uh, the anti-LGBTQ movement. You can compare it to the, uh, the fact that we, in the 70s, Republicans turned a country that didn't really have major objections uh, with abortion into a rallying cause for conservatives. There seems to be a power play here. We noticed one group in Utah which wasn't about book banning and has now become about book banning. They were about COVID restrictions. Well, that's right. I mean, one phenomenon we definitely see is that the anger and frustration that arose in relation to COVID restrictions has now been funneled into book banning and curriculum banning. And 
it's unfortunate. We have, we had a lot of documented learning loss during the pandemic, and now that's being compounded in these schools that are being turned into battlegrounds where people are surveilling teachers, they're going after teachers, they're seeking legislative restrictions, and it all distracts from teaching and learning, which should be our focus right now. I do think it's important to try to distill those who have a large political agenda, whether it's to dismantle the public schools or to make the public schools more religiously influenced, from parents who are need to be brought along into the ways in which our society and our curriculum is changing. You know, we passed a law uh, instantiating gay marriage this week, and you know, these people are ultimately going to find themselves to be in the minority, probably even in the communities where they're working. And they have a vested interest in protecting against government censorship. You know, today it may be them censoring books they don't like. The tables will be turned at some point, and it may be books that they very much believe in that others call into question. So at PEN America, we really stress the principle here, which is that the resort to censorship, to government bans on books, you know, no matter what the debates may be, there can be room for discussion about what's the right age to introduce certain concepts, whether certain books are too explicit for uh, a particular environment. We can discuss that. That can be a give yeah. and take between parents and teachers. But censorship book bans goes well beyond that. And, and for all the authors we've been talking about here at the Velshi Band Book Club, not a single one doesn't say that. That maybe my book's not for everybody. Don't ban it. But, but people's parents should have uh, a, an app, a, a say in what their children read. But let's have it as a real discussion. Thanks to both of you. It's been great to have you both here. Christopher Rhodes is a lecturer at Boston University and Harvard University. Sudan, Suzanne Nossel is the CEO of PEN America and the author of Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All.